Hello and, and welcome back. Um, I'm Lisa Otner Gauss. For those of you who might have just joined us right now, some very quick housekeeping rules. This session will be recorded and we are taking audience questions throughout. So you can simply scan a QR code that will appear from time to time just right now um, on screen. You can type in your questions online and they will appear here on my iPad and I will make sure to weave them in on the conversation. Just earlier, we heard from Standard Chartered's global research team that um, the world is not coming to an end, but that in fact, we are having a, a lot of very interesting pockets of growth that we're seeing, and undoubtedly, India is, 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 is one of them. Um, according to the IMF, India and China together will account for over half of 2023's global economic growth. And um, so that India meets its economic potential, the government has, has, has invested in a number of sectors. We heard Mr. Subramaniam speak earlier, digital, physical infrastructure, manufacturing, fintech, investments in renewable energy, in new technology, just to name a few. So there's no doubt really, and no question that um, the social and economic transformation of the country is, is tremendous. But is it enough to cement a new economic position for India on the world stage? And can all these gaps that, that also Anumbuti mentioned just earlier be filled to really make sure nothing stands in the way of the Indian century? Well, you're lucky because we'll soon to find out. Because joining me here on stage today is Mr. Harjit Kohli, Joint Managing Director, Bharti Enterprises, Ms. Shweta Jalan, Managing Partner and India Head of Advent International, Dr. Pravir Sinha, CEO and Managing Director at Tata Power, Ms. Harsha Bangari, Managing Director at Exim, and Mr. Henry Graber, Global Head of Credit Markets at Standard Chartered. A very warm welcome to all of you. Ms. Bangari, if I may start with you, please. Sure. Um, we haven't met, but I spoke to some of your staff, and of course, I've done my research. So you've been with Exim Bank for over 30 years. So you have really um, been around. You've held many, many different roles. I have no doubt that you have seen the bank transform and you've seen India transform. So if you had to summarize for us some of these most important um, massive shifts in public policy, what are they and also what role has your bank played in all of this? Sure. Thanks a lot, Lisa, and good afternoon. An absolute pleasure to be part of this August uh, audience. Uh, you made me feel a bit old, but I think I'll get Apologies. over it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, Exim Bank was set up 40 years back, so we are frankly 40 years old. And if I could summarize the journey of Exim Bank, it sort of reflects in a mini way of what's happened to the country and how the policy has sort of uh, trended or shifted over, a, uh, and I, I am sure it's for the good. Uh, 1980s, and I am going to now maybe spend one or two minutes and compress 40 years, you know. So we, 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 we started in 1980s, uh, India, we all know what was it at that point of time. We had very minuscule external trade. Uh, we were at that point of time also an important country. Today also we are an important country, but the dynamics have changed a lot. Uh, there was complete control, uh, so the economy was controlled economy, capital as well as current convertibility were just dreams and uh, uh, we were uh, going through various phases. So if you look back uh, in terms of, there are many similarities. Uh, so in 1980s when we looked at that, at that point of time there were regional conflicts, we are seeing those regional conflicts today, the oil prices were very high uh, and there was inflationary pressure on uh, India which continues today. And at that point of time one of the needs which was felt was of uh, uh, how precious is foreign exchange. So that was the genesis of setting up of the bank that is Export Import Bank of India because uh, typically the commercial banks in India would look at export credit on a shorter end but where you need uh, longer uh, ca requirements for working capital or export credit uh, there were many banks in, uh, in the commercial setup which were not really doing that job. So the initial thrust of the policy uh, was to sort of how do you encourage project exports happening from the country. If you remember those days, Indian companies would do most of the construction jobs in Middle East. Uh, that was their primary market. So how do you grow that and how do you help? So 
India exam was bank was set up so that you know you there could be some way of earning for uh, precious foreign exchange. Now from that time to today we have come a very long way. Uh, uh, we have started focusing more on uh, Indian investment and Indian trade. So it's not only exports, but how Indian companies can also invest in the overseas markets and globalize. Uh, also, what has happened is that, and that is something which I have personally experienced is that 1995 when I joined this bank. I was actually operating a scheme which was called as Export Marketing Finance Scheme, which was basically a grant which was given to India by World Bank. And that was to develop the export marketing or uh, export capabilities of the Indian companies. And uh, over that, from that time till today, if you see today, we are actually looking at providing aid. So we have sort of almost stopped taking aid as a country. And uh, we have now uh, uh, started sharing our developmental experiences with our partner countries. So today, Exim, or I would say India, uh, provides lots of aid to our partner countries in our neighboring countries and Africa. So I would say if you look at the value stage, we have sort of come a long way. But some of the things remain almost similar. So we still battle with inflation uh, we have our economy has grown it could have grown faster we really don't know but uh, if you really ask me and, and of course at that time the exchange rate was what eight rupees i remember eight rupees or nine rupees in the early 1980s uh, today of course we know where we are so uh, i think quite a bit of shift uh, but an interesting journey certainly very very fascinating very interesting thank you for walking us through this shifting our focus a little bit to the power sector um, um, the future of the power industry is a bright one. Um, the country's investment in, in, in growth is, is really driving clearly a lot of electricity demand. Um, when you and I discussed a little bit the panel, you um, rightly so mentioned to me that um, energy security, energy affordability and energy availability will really remain a key, key, key focus um, for the government who is really trying to power each and every sector of the country. We're very lucky to have you here with us today, Dr. Sinha. You are an electrical engineer by training. I'm told you are the expert when it comes to the power industry. So thank you very much for joining us. So what are some of the key trends you think we should be all watching out for when it comes to the power sector and, and how are you capitalizing on it at Tata. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you uh, to Zareen and Stan Chart for the opportunity, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, when I spoke to you last, and I think uh, uh, what is important to understand is that the power sector, uh, not only in India, but globally is going through a huge change, a transformation, a disruption wherein uh, the old way of generating power and, and supplying power is undergoing a, a transformation. <coughs> and when I say that, uh, there are three Ds uh, that we talk about that's happened in the power sector. Uh, one is, of course, the decarbonization. And uh, this is a reality where we need to understand that we need to decarbonize. We need to move away from the way the fossil fuel was being used for the last 100 years. And we need to move towards the clean technology. But when you move towards the clean technology, what happens? The second change that uh, we see is the decentralization. We typically had a scenario where large power stations were set up, large transmission systems, and then the last mile connectivity. That is undergoing change. Now you have people uh, who can generate locally, whether in cities or in villages. And I think that's the big change that is happening. And the third big disruption that is happening is the digital technology. How today you are using digital technology uh, for bringing in power. And what does that mean? That means that on real time, you are able to understand how much of usage of power is there. So what has happened is that there is a marriage of electrical technology and digital technology that has happened. and that makes you much more aware of how to produce and how to use power. And this is really important now when we talk of energy independence, we talk of energy security, and we talk of energy affordability, because uh, energy is something that everyone uses, whether it is the rich people, industries, commercial, or people in the villages. And how do we ensure that the affordability of electricity is ensured in each of the consumer classes. And I think uh, for India, this is a great opportunity. Uh, we were stuck for many years 
because we were dependent on large investments, large technology. Now, the democratization of energy has taken place. People in villages can produce. People doing farming can use their own energy. People in their homes and factories can produce and use it. And I think that's the transformation that we are seeing. And this is a big change that is happening globally and also in the country. For us in the country, uh, this is an opportunity to leapfrog from the conventional way of producing energy and moving into the new way. And that's the type of investment that we are seeing. Last year, globally, 1.1 trillion investment was done in the clean energy space. And uh, this was typically not only in generation, but also how do you transmit and use the energy. Most of it, of course, happened in fact, more than 50% happened in China. A uh, lot of it happened in US. Uh, India also, uh, there was not a very large investment, but something like 17 billion. Uh, China was 570 and US was 147. So what it shows is that the potential is huge. And for us, we've just started utilizing, leveraging the opportunity that is coming. And if we, are able to put everything together. And fortunately, in our country, we have more than 300 days of sunshine. The opportunity is huge. In fact, people tell me that the new oil for India is sun, mm -hmm. and no one can hopefully take away from us. It will always be there. So I think that's the change that India can do. And we can really become one of the biggest players, not only in this decade, but for many decades to come forward. And, and that's the opportunity of whether it is in setting up utility scale or, or even manufacturing facilities. And when I talk about energy security, it's about manufacturing. How do we produce and all these equipments in our country? And how do we make it reliable? And that means whether we talk about the battery technology, we talk about the hydrogen, we talk about nuclear technology. So I think there are so many opportunities for us, and uh, possibly this is the best time to be in the power sector in the country. Thank you so much, Pavi. That's why you're also smiling. It's a good place to be re-elected uh, for the second time as a, as a CEO, and you're clearly steering it in the right direction. Um, you mentioned one of the Ds being um, digitalization. Um, so, um, Mr. Coley, um, I'd like to bring you in on the conversation here just for a little bit. Um, Bharti Enterprises is, is clearly a massive and very impressive uh, multinational conglomerate. Um, you own businesses across the telecommunications sector, uh, manufacturing, insurance, real estate, just to name a few. And Bharti Airtel is, um, is one of your group's flagship companies. And um, I, I think it ranks as the top two mobile network operator globally. So it's, 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 it's an impressive um, um, organization. And so walk us through a little bit how, how has the telecommunication sector also, in your view, evolved? And, and what role has digitalization really played in, um, in this transformation of India? Sure. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> Thanks to all of you. Thanks for listening in. Thank you, Stanchel team. Uh, great to be here after COVID. Good to meet many people in person. It's obviously wonderful. Uh, look, telecom story is fairly well known. There are lots of goods. There are a few bads too. We've gone through a roller coaster ride, so I don't want to repeat all of that. But I do think in the context of what Lisa, you asked, is uh, we often hear India has got more than a billion population. I think that's probably the first slide of every consultant's presentation I've seen over the last many number of years. We should know that we actually got more than a billion SIMs in 2016-17 in India. So it's not that suddenly a lot of spate of SIMs which has increased in the last four, five, six years, but what has happened in the last four, five, six years is in the 16-17 year when we crossed over a billion SIMs, the unique users were possibly maybe two by third of the overall SIMs. Data users were probably one by a third or even lower. Smartphone penetration was less than 30%. Uh, but since then, while we still have 1.2 plus billion registered SIMs, I think the smartphone penetration has really, really gone up. To my understanding, and look, 
these are various data points. I'm giving you anecdotal stuff from what we know, reading our networks and consumers, is more than three-fourths of the population now has smarter phones. They may not be the smart test. Uh, and I think that's fabulous. Important to note that of these 800 odd million smartphones, in some form or fashion, data is getting used in rural with more than 350 million such rural consumers. That's the proliferation of what I think over the last six, seven years has uh, been achieved by telecom. Uh, I think the core drivers are s simple. I mean, there's nothing, nothing to hide away from the fact that coverage is more or less intensive now, but for any defense or regulatedly separated regions, more or less telcos have covered every other area. So I think geographic coverage is fairly good. We've gone deep into the hint hinterlands. Uh, the ARPUs are pretty low, but we still make money, uh, at least at the EBITDA level. And we'll talk about investments maybe a little more later. Uh, the key here is usage. Usage has been explosive in India. Indian consumers, now it's a common bundle. There is no voice or data. It's a bundle we pay for and in the bundle we do whatever we want. But Indian consumers are using more than 1,000 minutes a month. We are quite a talkative lot. But more importantly, we are using 20 GB per month on an average basis, which means there are people who are using more than 40, 50 GB because there are people who can only use 2, 3 GB. So average is 20 GB per month. You are having probably 180, 200 billion GBs per annum of capacity getting used on a retail consumer distributed deep down the interland level. That's the power which I think telecom is driving. Uh, and I think it'll continue. I think it'll continue. The key thing here is what I measure personally as a very anecdotal rule is if you are having a core intensity to drive a multi-purpose use of the connectivity of an intelligent nature, this industry is here to say. This might be another oil. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm glad you said that because this statement had been made earlier a couple of years ago, but not necessarily by us. So I'm very happy to hear, <laughs> I'm very happy to hear that. But, but clearly, this theme, to my mind, Lisa, is continuing. Let me also give you statistics. Globally, telecom does 1% of the GDP. But there are advanced markets, and Rick, you would have seen quite a few of them, where broadband terrestrial penetration is such that data usage will be that, that much lower. But in India, I think that is the only way you can go into the hinterlands, because there's just no other way. We're also about 1% of the GDP. So 30 odd billion dollars, a little more than that, is what the industry size is. But don't be surprised because this is actually probably half than what it should have been today because of the ARPU suppression for various other competitive reasons the industry has faced. So that, I think, is the, is the uh, size. Importantly, only these three, three and a half players has actually invested about $115 billion in the last 15, 20 years. Not an awful lot, but not a small lot either. Uh, if you take a debt equity of you know, two is to one, there's about $35 billion of equity sitting in the system today at work and not counting quite a few billion dollars which have been wiped off because, you know, at least seven, eight operators vanished. So there is a lot of invested capital. Now it's in some form, fashion is sitting in the networks. And that I think is the beauty. That network is available to be marginally utilized by the historical capexes that have been either sunk by people who are no longer anywhere available or by us. And I think that's the power. The marginal utility is fabulous. And I think from where we are, already densified networks. We have, um, like Airtel does about three odd billion dollars, a little more than that capex every year in India. Uh, the industry does about seven, eight billion dollars. And we'll, we'll continue to do that at least for one, two years, and then it'll taper down. Then you have these spectrums which will come by. So all of this investment and the earlier historical investment is densified the networks. The digitalization that you talked about is so massively pervasive now uh, that any technological transition is taking possibly literally nothing. 5G globally, and I'm not a big fan of 5G for use cases, but we'll come to that. Ultimately, technological transition also solves for capex intensities, for your capacities, for many other gates that open over time. But that said, 5G has been fastest in terms of penetration, even two years faster than what 4G had. Globally, one billion SIMs are now on 5G. In India, it's, it's starting over the last five, six months. So this transition is easier because densified networks are there. And digitalization wave, the India digital stack, the enablement of UPI, payments transfers, is basically allowing consumers to take consumption of services. 
digitally, any kind of service. It could be voluntary education, it could be mandatory education, it could be religion, entertainment, sports, it could be office, enterprise, softwares, whatever else. So I think that's going to continue. To my mind, we are absolutely sure. The piece which is adding up to this wrap, which I think will unravel in India faster now, is the enterprise piece in telecom. And I know people want to talk about consumers because ultimately it's a consumer product. The enterprise play is, you talked about it, Dr. Sina. I think it's important to know that Industry 4.0 today needs a deep digital transformation to in increase revenues, to reduce costs, to create more usability, to create a service proposition which is unbeatable, to create that competitiveness, and that digital transformation needs fabulous connectivity. So private networks will be seen, IoT will be seen, deep intelligence to try and create faster deliveries will be seen. Uh, we will have eSIMs go into billions of devices over time. And all of them, maybe they give us less than a dollar or two, just because, but they will be contracted for multi-years. They're all pre-embedded into the networks. So this drive, this digitalization is gonna continue. And at a, at a 5G consumer level to my mind, or 5G advanced over time, whether it takes three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, we will have all entertainment, ultra high definition movies, TVs, mobile gaming, everything uh, available in, at our hands. So that consumption of these services through digital activities is something we don't have a choice uh, but to rejoice in. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Jalan, we heard uh, about capital investments quite a few times. I would like to bring you in on the conversation now. Um, Advent International is, has been the leading private equity uh, investor in India since 2007. When we had our chat, you mentioned that over the past 15 years, you've invested over four billion dollars in in India across 13 companies so that's a really impressive number and um, you personally have been with Advent for around 13 years and um, you also mentioned to me that um, when you joined Advent um, you got involved in buyouts and that you were hooked you said there was no mm. turning back for you just really discovered you through passion in life so talk to us a little bit about what's going on in the buyout sector in India in the private equity sector what's the landscape like today Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So I mean, maybe I can talk a little bit about the evolution of the private equity industry. When I, which was not 14 years back, but I joined ICICI Venture 23 years back, we used to go to companies and talk about what is venture capital, what is private equity, what is seed capital, and it was really an unknown asset class in India, right? And from then on, if you, you know, cut to today, it's a, I won't say it's as mature in, in an industry as it's in the West, but I would say it's a very well-established asset class. People clearly understand what is angel investing, venture capital, private equity, and buyouts, right? So there has been this you know, huge transformation of the industry or building out of the industry in the last, I would say, couple of decades, but particularly in the last decade. Switching to buyouts in particular, I would say, again, when, we, when I joined in Advent, buyouts were quite few and far removed. From then, you know, today, it has, I can't again say it's as good as the West, but the buyout market has become very, very rich. The sources of transaction that we are seeing are quite interesting. One of the biggest sources of buyout transactions we are seeing in India is succession. And this is not only that I don't have a successor, but it could be I have a successor who's not interested in doing the business. It's been around, I have, you know, multiple children and I'd rather kind of split my wealth and not that not lead to chaos later in their lives or you know uh, the third that we've seen which is quite interesting actually is I don't think my success has the ability to take this business forward right so I'd rather actually sell and give him the money to, or him or her the money to do whatever they want right so that's one big bucket of uh, buyout opportunities we've seen the second big uh, bucket of buyout, buyout opportunities has been and I will say this, even Dr. Sina sitting next to me, is a lot of people, promoters, founders, diversified, you know, 10, 12 years back and went into real estate, power, other, you know, parts of infrastructure. And probably they not either the wrong timing or the, you know, wrong, uh, wrong markets they entered into at that point in time or lack of capability. Many of them got, got into trouble, right? And many deals have really come from founders who've, because of that, got over leveraged, had no option but to sell their cash cows or their, you know, I would say crown jewels in some ways, right? So whether it was Crompton or DFA, many of them came really from the challenges that those founders had, right? So that's a big source of uh, 
uh, source of transact buyout transactions in India. And third, I would say, which we were hoping will be the biggest source, but has been a le uh, lesser source, is really conglomerate selling of non-core businesses. So, I mean, we've just not seen that happen to the same measure. But I would imagine at some point in time that will, like in Japan, it took a long time to happen. I'm sure India, at some point in time, will get there where people will say, I want to be in these 10 businesses where I'm a leader and everything else I want to kind of sell off, right? So I think at that some point in time, that will become a bigger source of deal. So it's been a very interesting evolution of the buyout market. People have found their way around leverage, which is not available in the classic sense for buyouts in India. Uh, people have found their way around structures. So I think it's, it's kind of evolved in every aspect. And it's frankly a very, very interesting market. When I talk to investors globally, with everything that China is doing, India is becoming more and more interesting by the day, right? And people are really looking to India for doing more classical private equity, more classical buyout deals than, than they ever have, I think, in my 23-year career in private equity. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Pangari, can I bring you back in a conversation? Um, you mentioned earlier the import-export sector, how you've been really set up as a bank to really fuel um, import and export. So what have you seen, like what sectors have grown the most? Which ones have, have, have decreased and how has this all impacted India's trading partners? Okay. So uh, when initially in the early 80s, the focus of the uh, government was to encourage Indian exports in terms of project exports. So the idea was just to sort of maybe uh, export labor from India. I think that's where we started from. Uh, uh, increasingly, the need was felt to start developing the industrial segment in India and then start seeing if we can have an export share within the ex industrialized markets. Uh, typically, traditionally, Indian exports have been, uh, if I may say, commodity or a low val add uh, uh, products, which really doesn't make India a price uh, give, no price uh, giver. It's more of a price taker and that is something which I think the journey evolution or the aspiration has been. I'm not very sure whether we have reached there. I would say that our experience in the services sector have been has been excellent. So despite uh, constraints, I should say, and despite non-availability of maybe financial assistance, the services exports uh, from the country have done extremely well, and they are uh, one of the most important elements for us to support our balance of payments position because uh, they really uh, contribute a lot. On the merchandise export side, again, we are even today a large uh, importer. I think we are a big growing population and we love being the markets for the world. So I think we are happy with that fact. Uh, but the focus has been on how do you increase uh, the uh, contribution of high tech products or high value added products in your export basket. And how do you move that stage, you know, rather than being just a uh, exporter of a commodity or a raw material, how do you start exporting finished goods? And, and that's where, you know, the focus is hap happening even from the government side. Uh, Again, you know, in just, uh, if you see our GDP, uh, the composition of our GDP also, we are not having a good enough share of industrial, uh, industrial production in the GDP segment, despite uh, lots of efforts. Uh, so there, uh, the recent uh, uh, you know, you know, interventions from the government also in terms of production-linked incentive schemes where we are sort of focusing on certain key sectors which have uh, potential for exports. So I think that's where... Uh, I hope that going forward, uh, specifically, uh, if I may mention the sectors, uh, pharma, we have been doing well. Uh, auto components, we have been doing reasonably well. Uh, there's increased focus on electronics. So if you see the trend in our exports of electronics products, and I, I hope engineering also, but we, we are definitely seeing a faster pace of uh, growth in these sectors. Also, what other thing is happening is that if we see uh, are the MSME ecosystem in the country, uh, uh, it is understood that almost half or I would say 45% of India's exports are basically uh, contributed by the MSME segment. Now these MSMEs, uh, Indian uh, definition of MSME is very different from the global uh, definition of MSMEs and I don't think we are doing too great for our MSMEs. So if, if the MSME ecosystem also can sort of be developed or we can facilitate. So we are seeing increased... Uh, uh, participation of the MSMEs in our export story and to that extent uh, I, 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 we all are aware of our startup story so I think that's that's mm -hmm. something which I don't think any of us should take credit I think they're doing it well on their own uh, but uh, 
essentially the uh, the phase of uh, development that is the second phase after the startup financing where the sort of scale up that's where uh, we trying to see how we can facilitate and again the uh, focus would be on how do you add products which are high value added uh, in your export basket thank you mr raba um, earlier today we've heard from our CEO that uh, we've been in the country for 165 years. Um, I'm not going to age a second person. So you have not been around 165 mm -hmm. years, but no. I think coming up to 14, 15 years, and you are a true expert in credit markets. You were based together with me in Singapore. Now you're based in, in Dubai. And I know that you speak to, to international sponsors a fair amount of time. So I wonder in your mm. conversations, what, what themes come up? How are they looking at India and at what sectors are they particularly looking at? Thank you, Lisa. I think there's a few themes uh, developing, and many have been touched already on this panel throughout the day. But first is probably some of the shifts going on in capital and how it's being deployed. I think increasingly traditional capital pools are merging. So we've seen sponsors come together with sovereign wealth funds. We've seen quite a big shift in the private credit space, which is changing for banks or intermediate banks. And I think what's that leading to is a pools of capital willing to take longer term horizons and invest for stable, maybe slightly lower returns than historically been the case, but still looking at that high, low single double digit IRRs. And that is really coming together in the infrastructure space. That's not only the case in emerging markets, but also in the West. And we're seeing a huge expansion of infrastructure spending and investment by the private sector. Historically, that may have been dominated by the banks. Now, I think that's shifting quite dramatically into sponsors who are driving some very large funds. And that is a really good and powerful story around India. And I think also for sponsors, they're looking for large projects where they can deploy a significant amount of capital that will go into stable markets with stable uh, legislation and background supporting those infrastructure projects and the need for that. And infrastructure is really across a huge sector from ports to roads to digital. Uh, and I think India offers that opportunities and also long-term opportunities. I think it's an incredibly exciting time. I think we're going to see a lot more investment happening. And in our Asia region, there's also been a big shift. And we are seeing a lot more of capital being devoted to India specifically. And I think it will be the predominant market where a lot of this capital is going to come. And the execution of the projects has overall been very successful and in a relatively short period of time. And that obviously leads also into renewables. That's been a huge theme today and is going to continue to be a discussion topic. But solar, wind and moving to renewable power is really going to be one of the core dynamics that will change around the globe, I think. And if we look at the trade channels between the GCC, the Gulf into India, Southeast Asia, this is really going to be a very powerful investment opportunity that's going to deliver consistent and stable returns. And I think investors have recently seen quite volatile performances, both in equity and debt portfolio. So capital is looking for that long-term stable return. Thank you. I want to briefly shift gears and talk about the Indian um, startup ecosystem because um, it is the third largest in the world and we have an appassionado here on the, on, on, on the, on the panel with us. Um, Mr. Bharti, um, it's one of your personal passions. You are um, part of the India Angel um, Investment Network and when we talked about it, I was curious why you're so passionate about it and he said, well, it really allows you to get out of the boardroom and the, and the, and the spreadsheets and the PowerPoints and really be more in touch with actually uh, the younger generation changing consumer demand so tell us a little bit what kind of organizations are you most interested in how allow how does this allow you to connect the dots yeah I, I, happy to talk about it but you know not, not that i've got tons of money to invest but whatever little dabbling i've done is more as you said it's uh, the, the new life, the new thinking, the new technologies, the new problems the consumers are facing, and the new ways the startups are trying to solve the problem will not be available for the decision-making criteria people like us are going through for whatever multinational Indian conglomerate jobs that we do. I think it's important thereby to really have the, shall I say, touch with the reality of what's really happening. Ultimately, 
whether you call it a telecom company or a lifestyle company, it is a B to C company. We need to have a deep understanding of consumer behavior. And some of these startups are really challenging the way d traditional deliveries were done. Also finding nuanced new problems which they want to solve. And in the Indian context, they are absolutely fabulous. So I think that's the reason why I'm engaged. So you're right there. I personally, th there is there is a lot of space there. I mean, we've got more than 6,000 startups. At IN itself, we've seen probably at least the ones which I've seen, at more than about 400, which we've, we've seen the pictures, et cetera. Uh, across the areas, and I think these days, tech can be added to any other sector, and it could be made, you know, education mm -hmm. tech, insure tech, fintech, health tech, <laughs> agri tech. You know, so I do, I do think I like the tech part. I mean, I, my personal view is you, you will find ways of creating more digital brains in any setup. A digital brain will give you more insights ahead of time, and I'm not using the word generative AI, but it's simply like in Airtel, you realize that every person used to go walk for a recharge. It's better for the person who's offering the recharge to say, well, I know your kind of usage, you should take this pack of recharge. So the next best offer, NBO scheme that we came out with, is essentially a digital brain activity. So you track things and you get a sense and you utilize it. So many startups are doing it. I like three or four areas personally. My favorites are in no particular order, enterprise tech. We talked about industry 4.0, anything that is bringing digital transformation. And by the way, if you see Indian startups, enterprise techs will give you the maximum chance of making profits today as is speaking. I mean, there are lots of losses. The entire ecosystem is still burning $8 billion a year in, in losses, but they make $20 billion top line, so it's okay. They're, they're, they're feeding 1 million employees. There is 3 billion of ad spend, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, the second area which I like is what I call as leisure tech. Leisure tech essentially is anything to do travel, hospitality, voluntary education, religion. Because India's themes are changing, we have more income and more time at hand this piece will evolve and become central to our day-to-day -day lives and more number of families and more number of people within the families will need these services. So I'm absolutely open to any of these. Third is health tech. Again, post-COVID world changes, our increased awareness for day-to-day -day health, all of us, individually, families, and ecosystem-wise. I think thereby health tech is very important for me. Logistics, I continue to believe, has a deep application on tech side. It is hard rolling stock in one form or the other, but the tech-oriented logistic solutions is something which I, I, I like myself. So I think these are the areas. Happy to uh, chat on the side on some of the names that I have dabbled into. Some are good, some are not so good, some are, some are off It's fascinating. Charts. Maybe we should have a whole session next year on, on, on the startup um, you know, system and ecosystem in India. Yeah. It's absolutely fascinating. At least half yeah. a trillion dollar value will come wow. from this system in the next four to five, at least half a trillion. It's already half a trillion. There will be a trillion more. I mean, there's no, no doubt about it. Fantastic. Impressive ideas for new jobs for myself here. No, I'm joking. Mm -hmm. um, let's pivot to investments in renewables. It's come up in numerous conversations that we've had. It's very, very, very important. And um, India is the third largest energy consuming country in the world. It is also number four when it comes to renewable energy capacity. And Dr. Sinha, under your leadership, Tata Power has made important strides. I think only last year, a BlackRock asset-led consortium invested a considerable amount of money into Tata Power. So what, what is the future, your future renewables portfolio? What are your plans around that? Uh Right now, uh, we have nearly 37% of our assets, uh, which are clean carbon or clean energy uh, generation, which includes uh, renewable and is also hydropower plants. But uh, going forward, I think we'll become about 70%. So when we looked at what is our future plan, uh, we need to transition. And it just cannot be a knee-jerk reaction that we say that from tomorrow we close our existing plants. So what we need to do is, how do we transition from our existing generation? Uh, what are the things that we do over there so that the clean technologies can be used and we can be zero effluent, zero gas, uh, and zero solid waste? And then how do we put new investment in clean energy technologies? And clean energy is not only about solar or wind, but I mentioned to you that we need to make it reliable. We need to have resilience, and that means 
We need to invest in storage. We need to invest in hydrogen. We need to invest in also in nuclear power. And we need to come up with solutions which are, again, cost of power, affordability, and access to all. So the universal access of energy is a very important component. So we are working in all these areas. Uh, there are a lot of innovation and work that is happening. The second area that we do a lot of work is uh, providing the last mile connectivity. How do we make the grids smarter? How do we bring access of energy uh, in urban as well as rural areas? Because it's not just providing the energy in urban areas, but if we do not do it in the rural areas, you will have a lot of people moving into the cities and we will continue to have the challenge of crowding of cities that will take place. And that's an area that, again, uh, we do a lot of work in terms of smart metering, smart grid, uh, SCADA system, the automation. And uh, uh, talked about, Harjit talked about how do you do the industry 4.0? How do you use IOTs? How do you use sensors? And how do you, on real-time basis, uh, manage the consumption of energy? How do we provide and enable the consumer whereby they can control uh, their gadgets, uh, uh, electrical gadgets, and their uses. So today, technology is available over there where we can monitor each and every consumption that takes place. So there is a signature analysis. So if you start an air conditioner at your home, I know that Lisa has started an air conditioner, and or you've started or using your washing machine or anything. So we can do that analysis, and based on that, we can decide what sort of supply we need to provide to you. So I think there's a whole lot of work that is happening at the retail end or at the B2C end, which traditionally was not happening. The utilities were monopolistic. They, people used to take half day leave earlier in earlier times to go and pay the bill, because if you don't pay the bill, you will, your supply will get disconnected. Uh, in uh, uh, semi-urban areas, supply of electricity would not be there. 24-7 in villages and in smaller cities in India used to mean that you will get 24 hours in seven days, not in one day. So that was the <laughs> understanding in which uh, we used to work uh, in earlier time. So things have changed. Today, everyone has digital technology. They send a message to everyone. If today there is a supply in remote part and I'm supplying like I do in Odisha, from that place, that person will send me a message that what sort of a supply your people are giving. You are a useless person. You are not even supplying me electricity. I am sleeping in dark or I have no electricity in my home. So I think the whole uh, transition that is happening, uh, Tata Power is driving. We are the, in the forefront. Today, we use most of the technologies in these spaces, which are as good as anywhere else in the world. And Thankfully, because of the digital technology, we are able to have a line of sight of supply to everyone. And I think uh, uh, many of the things that we are seeing in the country will actually transform the way the energy is being produced and, and consumed in the country. Uh, people are talking about not just being consumers, but presumers of electricity. So you produce also, use, and then sell it in the, you, uh, in the community. So I think there is a massive shift that is taking place in terms of the energy space. And I, I feel that uh, uh, there will be a lot of opportunities to startups as well as to uh, conventional players, technology players, and there will be a lot of partnership and collaboration that will happen. Thank you. Um, you mentioned energy transition and financing. Um, I know this is also very much at, at your heart, Ms. Pangai. Um, what, what is Exim doing in this area? So. Uh, I know I may be sounding a little different than what uh, the general perception about climate finance is, but uh, in India, uh, you know, uh, there's no standard template of what you call ESG or a climate financing. And uh, 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 for us, basically, uh, uh, the, we, we, I, I, we are not very comfortable with the straight jacket uh, definition of climate finance because climate finance typically means that you will look at sectors which have zero or near zero carbon emissions, which is, I think, in India context is not so it's quite difficult or practically impossible to find. So I, uh, the idea is that how do you contribute and uh, contribute to maybe reducing carbon footprint because uh, 
say 30 percent of carbon emissions actually are coming from hard to abate sectors you know materials industries and others so uh, how do you help or finance the uh, finance the process which these companies or industries are going through uh, to transition to reduce their carbon uh, footprint so that's where uh, as exam bank we are uh, we're very much involved and we'd love to work on that and that's the theme which the government of india also has so uh, the, uh, we are talking about uh, our net zero targets, of course, India has committed 2070 for net zero. Today, uh, of course, my colleague mentioned, but in terms of India, uh, our reliance on renewable energy, and I have to include hydropower in that, is around 45%. So we are still dependent to the extent of 55% on fossil fuel. I am not seeing that going away uh, in near future. The idea is only to become more and more conscious. So in Exim, and I'm sure in the other banking uh, banks also, what we have done is that there has been increase, increasing consciousness in terms of uh, these elements you know when you uh, finance a particular project and how do you add you know we're we talking about adding premiums if uh, uh, it's not really aligned with the ESG uh, uh, definitions or ESG intentions of the uh, so and we are also we actually recently issued a, a billion dollar of bonds which was frankly which was only going to be used for sustainable financing so uh, so the idea is by raising because investors also like sustainable finance and they like climate finance and transition finance so idea is how do we start mapping our assets and sort of try to maybe uh, softly encourage uh, indian companies and entities to move towards more conscious use of power and you know uh, reduce their uh, carbon emissions Ms. Chalan, um, ESG and responsible investment is a big, big focus, of course, also for um, Advent. And um, I was doing again my research, and if I'm mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I, you came up as one of the very few private equity firms to actually work with um, S&P Global Sustainable One on promoting key ESG practices in your portfolio company. So I'm wondering how how does that work in practice? Yeah. That's correct. So we've partnered with SNP. We have their SNP has a sustainability index. And what we do is uh, they do an sustainability audit for all our portfolio companies. So are we doing it for 100% of the companies today? I think the answer is no, but I think we've disseminated it across Europe. In India also, we have got them to do an audit of five of our uh, 12 portfolio companies. What they do is at the end of the audit, they come, come up with, you know, where are we, where do we stack up on the ESNG, right? And out of that coming with very, uh, I would say measurable goals around what more should we be doing around governance or environment or social, all of, all of the, you know, uh, three objectives and how we move the needle. And then we repeat that at the end of 12 months and 24 months so that we see and map our and measure our progress against that. Frankly, I mean, for private equity firms in general, you know, not only Advent, this is no longer a luxury. It's a necessity. I don't think we can exist or we can raise capital from the kind of pension funds, endowments, and our investor base if we are not really top of the line in terms of ESG, right? So that's what we've done. And I would say even in India, I think we've made great progress. We have our packaging, we have a packaging asset which has one of the largest recycling plants in India now. Uh, our API company, which is an active pharmaceutical ingredient company, chemicals, so they have a fair bit of liquid dis discharge. We have our largest plant is zero liquid discharge. So in our own way, I would say, you know, we are trying to contribute. And even Advent as an organization, if you go for an off-site, off we, you know, look at the carbon footprint and give back, you know, in, in some form or the other so that we neutralize that to a large extent, right? So high level of uh, not only consciousness, but a lot of action orientation, both at the advent level and the portfolio company level on the ESG side. Thank you. Just before we move on, um, because we will have to wrap this up in a minute, um, can we focus on the S, the social aspect, just for a little bit, um, uh, Mr. Kohli? Um, you mentioned that you have around 50 million monthly users in your payments bank business today. And um, that would strike me as um, just a lot of people. And you mentioned to me that um, the, many of them are from the bottom half of the social pyramid. So it clearly plays a very, very important role in, in socially transforming the country. Talk to us briefly about that a little bit. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. Uh, the <clears throat> the Adel Payments Bank is around for the last, I think, four or five years now. It is a profitable vehicle, first up. Not many fintechs the other way in the startup domain are profitable. Uh, they have over 100 million such potential account holders, users, wallet owners, 
58, 60 million are monthly transactions. So they are really the recursive users of this situation. More than 25 million of those, uh, these are, are from tier three or tier four, five or six mm -hmm. towns. Tier six is uh, it's almost a village where the population is less than 20,000. There is no chance on earth there is a bank branch there. I apologize, yeah. including to Stanchard, because it is prohibitive to be there. It's just not possible. The nearest bank branch could be as far as 11, 12, 13, 15 kilometers. So really, the banking inclusion part cannot be met. But Airtel was doing recharges there, right? So Airtel uses that uh, distribution architecture, rents it out to the payment bank. Payment bank has now over 500,000 such retail points, which are banking points. You can actually operate your basic cash in, cash out needs. You can send remittance, you can get remittance in. So your, you can get your direct benefit transfers in to the extent, you know, last two, three years, COVID related DBDs also have. Last year, by the way, $30 billion in cash was the DBD in 22, 23. Uh, not counting the in-kind, uh, you know, benefit transfers. And bulk of that goes to these uh, Janadhan accounts, which, uh, you know, Adel Payments Bank also opens. So really, it's a grassroots level work. Uh, with 500,000 such banking points, we believe we are truly serving that white space, which is otherwise not servable. And that service, with no disrespect to the philanthropic outfits, is profitably served today. Because you've made models which can earn out of low ticket, high volume transactions in telecom, you port that into payments bank. So that's really what, what we are doing. Thank you. Um, one last question for, uh, from Ms. Jalan before we move to the very last question, I promise. Um, <laughs> so we've talked a lot about all the good stuff that is really happening, but um, it strikes me that of course, hurdles remain. Um, it's not unique to India, red tape, um, um, bureaucracy. So I wonder when, when you advise, um, you know, when you think about like, what could the government and corporates really do to make it as a more investable country? What are you thinking about? So I should split that into government and corporates, right? Yeah. So for government, sometimes I feel they should just do nothing for some time. <laughs> you know? <laughs> just, you know, uh, because sometimes, you know, I, I think the, uh, it tends to be more disruptive. So there was demonetization or uh, GST, long-term good, short-term impact from a more micro industry standpoint, you know, they will just come up with this angel tax. So I feel, you know, just give us a dull day, right? <laughs> Do nothing. Uh, that's, that's on a lighter vein. But I would say from the government, there are a few things, right? I think uh, one, I would say better execution whenever they have uh, any policy and reforms that they announce. And by better execution, I would mean both in terms of the thought process uh, getting the whole public-private partnership and the thinking of the policy frameworks because sometimes I think the second, third level order of thinking, there, there are some gaps, right? So that's one thing I would you know, certainly say that I would expect. The second is infrastructure, de infrastructure development. A lot is happening, but again, speed of execution there. Uh, I think that is eventually, you know, today is a bottleneck and will continue to remain a bottleneck, right? So I think those are the two big themes I would, uh, you know, say from a policy framework and infrastructure development for government. For corporate, I mean, a corporate sector, I would say there has been a lag in terms of capex, right? And that, you know, private sector capex has just hasn't picked up in the last, I don't know how many ever years. So I think that's a ram that hopefully we should be able to see in the next few years, and that will be very important for the overall GDP growth of the economy. Thank you. I'm going to ask you all one very last question, and you're only allowed to answer it in a one-word answer. So that's the rule. Um, and that is, what can the world expect to see from India? Why don't we start with you, Ms. Bangal? So I, I am not a person of less words, you know. So <laughs> if you allow me, maybe if you allow me three, four lines, and it's more of an aspiration, but I'm sure we're going to reach there. So what? how do we look forward to is... Uh, uh, for India is to become a global leader and uh, become a partner for sustainable development. That's what we aspire. Let's see how long it takes for us to reach there. Thank you. Dr. Sinha, would you like to go next? Uh, I think uh, for India, this is the decade and century for India. And uh, this is a great opportunity for us to uh, not talk about the big things, but to deliver the big things. Ms. Jalan? Let's say credible and scale manufacturer for the world. Mr. Kohli? I, I think we're at a decisive cusp of leadership. This next 30 years will be 3x of last 60 years put together. 
Mr. Raba, you get the last word. Sustainable growth. Thank you very much to our panelists. Um, thank you all for, for listening to us. Coming up next is a networking break, but I have to say, in case you were wondering what all these butterflies are all about, I mean, you see them also as your centerpieces. So as you know, the theme of today's conference is about growth and transformation. So we picked the butterfly as a universal symbol of growth, of transformation. Our creative team told me that the butterfly flopping in around is actually the national Indian butterfly, the oak leaf butterfly, for those of you who didn't know. I did not know. There is some fun um, augmented reality that you can interact with. We'll show you this outside later. For me, it's a big thank you to all of you. And um, I see you all after the networking break. Thank you very much. Goodbye.